have Ellie bring my water up for me, please? Sorry. Thank you, sweetie. What a blessing that is, huh? You ever sit back sometime and just think of how much of a blessing it is in the crazy world and how much we could just sit around here and say how bad everything is? That the Lord gives us just a place of reprieve. That, you know, like all the talent in the world isn't, you know, been absorbed by the world. <laughs> that there's still, there's, still some, there's still some folks that want to get together on a Sunday night and open up an old King James Bible and sing old time hymns and sing songs like that. And you go, man, Lord, thanks for letting me just be a part of that. What a blessing that is. You see, singing those kinds of th- songs right there and, uh, and having the Lord just kind of just park for a second and meet with you. That's, that's a byproduct. That just doesn't happen. It's a byproduct of, 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 you know, people and their attitudes and their walk with the Lord and the way that they approach things. And uh, I was talking to some folks this afternoon and, you know, looking for a church. And, and it's like, well, what churches, uh, a lot of the churches, are, they're going to the contemporary music services, you know, and they're, they're bringing in the, the CCM type songs and that kind of thing. And it's like, you, you miss out on all of that right there. You know, the Lord, he, he honors that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I'm just thankful that the Lord gives us a place where we can, we can enjoy that. And man, praise the Lord for that. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's why we, we guard things so closely. You know, uh, we're not just going to let somebody come in and sing and somebody to come in and do whatever they want to do because this isn't the platform for that you know as I've been thinking and and pondering over the topic of music for some time and I've said some things here in the past but that's a that's that's a ministry that is that I think is going the way of the American Indian if you think about reading you know accounts of Sankey and all these different guys, the evangelists, they used to travel with their singers, with their song leader. It was a position that traveled with, you know, uh, these, these great evangelists that you hear about and that kind of thing. And they would sing and they would sing uh, and sing specials and their specials were hymns. And, uh, and God would just move down in these massive rallies and, and these people, they, they, they look forward to, to hearing these songs that were sung because they were sung the right way. And, and these evangelists, they, they, and these big-time preachers, they knew that they just couldn't let anybody come in and just, you know, sing. It was, a, it was, a, it was something that was taken seriously. And, uh, you know, you should take it seriously, too. If God puts a, gives you an opportunity to sing a special, you should take it seriously and, uh, and, and, and desire that the Lord would flow through you and minister when you sing. And that's what that was. That was a ministry, and praise the Lord for that. Take your Bibles, go to the book of Ephesians again tonight. I do have another perfectly written announcement here. Miss Hope, she, uh, she gave me a, uh, an announcement. I don't think I've ever seen better handwriting in an announcement. <laughs> the problem is, is I'm looking at this right here, and then I'm looking at my notes, and I'm thinking, I am I'm so dumb. <laughs> now, I mean, it's, it's sometimes miraculous. You know, I look at how dumb I am sometimes. And uh, it's a... Uh, on December 23rd, we'll be having door-to-door outreach, um, inviting people to the Christmas Eve service. So uh, if you want to participate in that, be at the church at 9.45 a.m. And there'll be um, like uh, some organizing and that kind of thing, and then they'll send out in groups. So if you want to be a part of that, that's December 23rd here at the church, 9.45, 9.45, 9.30. 9.45. All right, Ephesians chapter number one. We were in there in Sunday school, and I feel like we got far enough into the gillyweeds to where uh, <laughs> maybe we can keep, keep moving and, and get to a different place here. But uh, we'll just jump off in verse, uh, in verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things, after the counsel of his own will. Uh, let's see here. Um, oh, man. 
Brother Jerry, would you pray uh, for the for the teaching tonight, brother? Father, thank you again, Lord. We have the privilege to go to you, whether it's to escape for us, Lord, or we uh, get peace from the world, Lord. Uh, pray that, thank you for that, Lord. Uh, pray that you'd uh, uh, heal up our pastor in the time tonight, Lord. Pray that Amen. you'd try to our preacher tonight, Lord, Brother Joe. Message that you have us here, Lord. Pray that you make us spiritual listeners, Lord. Help. We ask you help. We, we need you tonight, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We kind of wrapped wrapped it up in verse ten uh, this morning when we talked about that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. We talked about how that was a future event. We talked about the cross reference over in First Corinthians chapter fifteen. How Christ is uh, is uh, how Christ is subject to the Father, and that's in uh, Philippians. Go ahead and turn there because I didn't hit that reference this morning. Turn to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. Look in verse number seven. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men, and being found in this fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, because he subjected himself, in those two verses, uh, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, because of his subjection to his Father, uh, he is exalted, right, even above uh, God himself, the, uh, Jehovah. And in doing so, God uh, uh, exalts him. But when the fullness of time comes in, he says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, verse 12, uh, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh both in you to will and do of his good pleasure. Okay, so he, he, is, then, he is then brought back into subjection um, underneath uh, the Father in eternity future. So once the white throne judgment is completed and all this is subdued uh, underneath his feet, he then, <coughs> he then basically submits himself back underneath God the Father, and that's when we get into the, and Christ becomes all in all, or God becomes all in all, and that's where I you know, wave the white flag, and I say I don't know what that means, right? <clears throat> but I wanted to give you that, and just uh, another cross-reference, Acts chapter 3, as far as this being a future event, the dispensation of the fullness of times, this is known in Acts chapter 3. Look in verse number 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of his uh, holy prophets since the world began. Okay, so there's a time of restitution. There's a time that's coming out in the future where God, he makes everything. Uh, he takes care of everything and fixes everything. And uh, this, is, this time of restitution, this uh, dispensation of the fullness of times is, again, something that we don't have to worry about, but God will worry about. Um, and the only thing to take away from it from a practical sense is I'm good. <laughs> and he's got the thing worked out. And I've done what I'm supposed to do, and that's accept Christ and get saved. Amen. All right? <clears throat> now, there's uh, two heresies from this passage I want you to be familiar with, excuse me, on, uh, on, on what is taught here in this verse. Uh, the first thing here is post-millennialism. And a lot of you in here have heard of that term. We believe in uh, what we call premillennialism, and that is we are raptured out of here before uh, uh, the, or excuse me, uh, that premillennialism, that there's a pre, that he comes back uh, in the second advent and everything, it basically gets worse before it gets better. And then post-millennialism is this, uh, this thought of bringing in the kingdom, okay? And so uh, if you're writing stuff down, it's our time is gradually stretching out until, the, until it automatically becomes the fullness of times. So when he says the, fu- the dispensation of the fullness of times, that that's a future event that we're just going to basically 
keep working on the human race and we're going to etch away at this thing and eventually we're going to bring in the kingdom. That's what we're going to do. Anybody ever heard that before, you know, bringing in the kingdom? And uh, what's that crazy lady who wrote that, that hymn where stomping out the vineyard where the grapes of wrath are stored and all that kind of stuff? That is a wild, <laughs> wild teaching. But uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to think that basically uh, what, uh, Glenn Beck actually teaches that. <laughs> if you, th- those of you who are politically charged, Glenn Beck is a, is a uh, post-millennial kind of guy. And uh, you're basically thinking that everything is going get, to keep getting better and keep getting better. And we'll have to fight off the forces of evil. But uh, eventually, everyone's going to be converted to Christ. And once Jesus Christ sees how great of a job we've done, he'll come back and then he'll sit on the throne and say, what a great job you guys did. Thanks. <laughs> that's, that's, I guess that's, a, that's, that's one thing. And then another thing is universal salvation. And that is simply this. All things in that verse, verse number 10, he says, uh, uh, together in one, all things in Christ, that all things there refers to sinners on the earth. But not just sinners. That refers to sinners. That refers to demons, devils, fallen angels, and including people in hell, eventually, we're all going to just be all absorbed into Jesus. And we're all going to sing Kumbaya and be happy-go-lucky and go off and to the sunset with one another, right? And that is a quite liberal teaching, but it's been taught for many, many years. Uh, however, the problem is, is that the subject matter of verse 10 is not people. It's things, Okay, it's not people, it's things. And you say, how do you know that? Well, look in verse 11. It, it is followed up immediately with what he's talking about. In whom also we have what? Obtained an inheritance. That's a thing. That's not a people. Right? And so if it's a thing, well, you've got a problem. Because we're not talking about people getting saved and bringing in a kingdom and... and furthering, you know, what, what was started back in the Old Testament and all this different stuff, we're talking about something that uh, is, is a thing. And, and the reason that that's important for you to understand these two, uh, these two um, heresies is because now what you find in verse 11 is when you look at all your new Bibles, I'd say probably 90% of them take out that word inheritance altogether. Now, again, why in the world would you do that? <laughs> why, would you take out, why would you take out that word inheritance? Uh, it's because you want that thing to be people. So what they, what they do is they change that to that you're made a heritage. That's what they change it to, that you were made a heritage or that you were made an inheritance. See how slick that is? What they just did is they then made that thing a person. And it's not a person. It's a thing. <laughs> now, some of you, I don't know, maybe you think this is kind of weird. And what's like, why are you even thinking about that? This is how, th- this is how, this is how people, these are the verses that people gravitate to when they teach what they want to teach. And you have to be under, you have to understand that this is, for one, uh, we don't, like we said this morning, we don't uh, change the Bible to fit our doctrine. We don't read our doctrine into the Bible. And so what you find out is this is a, this is a referring to a heavenly inheritance that uh, the Lord has, has, has set up. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. We'll go there here in just a minute. So uh, it's, it's just funny because anytime they have these, these verses that, um, you know, kind of linchpin, you know, the, 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 the important verses that show you exactly what he's talking about, they change those verses and they think, oh, well, that was just a better rendering because... Well, no, it wasn't. You know, you can't make it. You can't change. You can't change a thing into a people. All right. Um, when he's talking about people, he's very specific in what he's talking about. Look in verse fourteen. What does he call people in verse fourteen? He calls them the purchased possession. He does not call them an inheritance. So when he wants to address people, he can address the people the way he wants to address them. And uh, it's not an, uh, the, the people are a purchased possession. They're not an inheritance. We get an inheritance because we're adopted in verse 5. That connects that thing back to the predestination. 
We were predestinated to be adopted, right? And so all those things work together in showing you what he's, exactly what he's talking about. So we'll read that verse again. And whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Okay, so... Um, that, uh, that we who first trusted in Christ, that is uh, basically, they, well, they'll take that last phrase here, who first trusted in Christ. Now, again, I'm just telling you this, and we'll get into some practical stuff in a minute, but uh, I'm telling you this stuff because this, this is the, the battlefield that is the Bible. And uh, when he says, who first trusted in Christ, you say, uh, well, how could you possibly... That, to me, that's a self-explanatory verse. Like, you don't need, a, you don't need 30 minutes of exposition on, on uh, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Right? But if I have an ulterior motive and I have an agenda that I want to teach you something, what I will do is I will take uh, verse 12, and I will, if I'm a hyper-dispensationalist, right, I will say that uh, there's, there's actually uh, two different bodies. So you have the ones who first trusted in Christ, and you have these ones over here, and what you do is you start splitting up the Bible more than it needs to be. And some of you in here, you know people who were Bible believers, and they were dispensational, and they were all fine on their doctrine, and then they got off into the gillyweeds, and now they're hyper-dispensationalists, and they try to get the church starting here, and the church starting here, and Paul is this, and... They start cutting out different Pauline doctrines because the church didn't start till here. You see what I'm saying? And you say, where do, they, where do they pull it from? A verse that is, if you folks in here, you think I'm crazy that I'm even stopping at verse 12 to talk about this stuff. Because you can look at that verse and know exactly what he's saying. <laughs> but you got to read into it somehow. Look at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now this should be a verse that clears up any kind of problems whatsoever. With no other exposition needed, this verse shows you the, uh, the timeline of your salvation and how things came about and how things came to be. And uh, a lot of this, you have, if you want to just jot this down, if you're writing notes, you, uh, you preach, right? God sends preachers, you hear, faith come up by hearing, hearing by the word of God, you believe, and then you call. That's your salvation. He chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, right? How can they hear without a preacher? And then faith come up by hearing, hearing by the word of God, I believe, and then I call upon the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. That's as simple as it gets. And whom he also trusted, after that he heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation, and whom also that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, when we talk about salvation and the doctrine of salvation, there are some things that take place at the, at, in the doctrinal side of salvation that is pretty amazing that uh, you get instantaneously without even knowing it. And, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a list here real quick. We won't run every one of these verses, but I'll give you a list. Um, when he says that you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, um, he says, after that ye believed, uh, Ephesians uh, right here, he says, you were sealed, okay? And then you were adopted, you were justified, you were predestinated, you receive the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's Romans uh, 4. You are sanctified, 1 Corinthians 6. And you are spiritually circumcised, Colossians chapter 2. You say, when did that happen? All at the moment you accepted Jesus Christ. That very moment that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Then you got the whole cart. <laughs> you had a truckload that day. Amen. Right? Now, here's the thing. We don't talk about these doctrinal things a whole lot anymore. This is like, and it's not, and it's not that they're not taught anymore, but it's that we're not, we're not enthused with it anymore. It's that it's not, it's not fun, <laughs> you know? Like, uh, we, we, it's like we already know that. 
<laughs> Why are we talking about it? We already know that. But you understand that that right there, your doctrinal standing in Christ, what you were given, is the source of your joy, happiness in the Christian life. What you were given that day is an amazing thing that should keep you going uh, no matter what's going on in your life. Okay, now this thing of uh, eternal security uh, is, is, is a big deal. Take your Bibles, go to Galatians uh, chapter 5. We'll start here. Galatians chapter 5. And I've met a lot of folks that, you know, struggle with that. And, and, uh, and it's not just young people that struggle with it. I've met a lot of older folks that still struggle with it. Let's see here. I want to... Let's start in verse 17. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, this is Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, uh, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Here we go. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that has been taught for years and years and years that if I have one of these things show up in my life as a Christian, I am in danger of not inheriting the kingdom of God. Therefore, I will not be saved. You understand? Now, you could see at face value when you read that, you could say, well, that makes sense. That's what he said, okay? What he said is you should not inherit the kingdom of God. He didn't say that you wouldn't be saved. You see how subtle that is? And so you have to be careful because what, what I say all the time, words matter, okay? Words matter when we're talking about the Bible. He says that you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Something similar here. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You see that? Same teaching. You know that if you do these things, you are not going to heaven. You can lose it or it's evidence that you never had it. Especially, and this, and this, is, a, this is a problem uh, from... I say this without being a jerk. I don't know. <laughs> it comes from, it comes from this, this take a verse, take a fit preaching that happens uh, from, from preachers that have never been taught anything and can't be taught anything. And you take this and, and you understand the very base layer of, of scriptural interpretation, uh, and just the base layer, and you just see the carnal side of everything. And, and you, don't, you don't know where you're at, and so you say things, and you go, well, that sounds good, right? And you say, well, you know, if you were really saved, you wouldn't be doing this. How in the world could you say that? How in the world could you draw that conclusion? The fact of the matter is, is that a saved person can do anything a lost person can do when it comes to works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. That's not exclusive to lost people. That's exclusive to people with flesh. Do you have that? <laughs> I do. What does that mean? I'm prone, if I don't watch my flesh, my flesh can get out of hand real, real quick. You understand? Just like if you don't watch your flesh, your flesh can get out of hand real, real quick. And there's been some tragedies of Christian character that many of you could tell stories until you're blue of the face of things that Christians have done or so-called Christians have done. And you go, how in the world could that happen? I know, they're flesh. Just like you. Now the naive person will take this and say, well, see, if you got that in there, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. You can't go to heaven. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. Let's, uh, let's go back here to uh, our, our, our text here where he says in verse, um, uh, verse 13. He says that after that you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? So 
After that ye believe, you receive with that Holy Spirit of promise. Let's see the other side of this thing. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, look in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here we go, look at this. To an inheritance. So the inheritance was given to us after uh, being blessed of God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the abundant mercy He hath begotten us again to a lively hope. Okay? So after that, now we are, we, are, we are given an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, re, uh, reserved in heaven for you. Look at this. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, uh, you're in heaviness through, look at this, manifold temptations. You see that? Temptations of what? Of your flesh. Manifold temptations of your flesh. Okay? That the trial of your faith be made more precious and of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Okay? Whom ye have not seen, ye love, and uh, whom ye now see, uh, see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Okay, so this inheritance, this is a, uh, this is a physical inheritance that is, uh, or a heavenly inheritance that is given uh, and, and that you have received. And when he talks about inheriting the kingdom of God, he's talking about an inheritance that you can earn. You have an inheritance as far as the home in heaven is concerned that is reserved in heaven for you that fadeth not away. But according to the doctrines of the judgment seat of Christ, you know that there is things that you can do to receive rewards uh, in heaven more so than just going to heaven all by itself. That if I, if I, if I uh, sow into the flesh, I shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if I sow to the Spirit, I shall, what does he say? Reap life everlasting. He tells you another spot to lay hold on eternal life. Well, how do you do that? I can't lay hold on my salvation any more than it's already been given to me. So what does he mean by laying hold on eternal life? That means striving for it. That means going after it. That means realizing that there's more to life than just getting saved and going to heaven and, 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 and that's it. No, he's, he's given you an opportunity to put on that, to put on the, be tried by the fires, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And he says that you will be tried of the things that are done in your body, whether they be good or evil. You see that? So you have an inheritance that's reserved in heaven for you, but you also have an inheritance that you can receive because of your service for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to inherit that, you had better mind your P's and Q's and keep your flesh in line. You see that? Now, if you try to teach that any other way, you mess up everything. You mess up everything. Because all these doctrines are intertwined with one another. And you can't, you can't just take one thing and, and, uh, and, and, and run with it. You've got to be true to everything and how it works together. Okay? So he says here that uh, you're, you're going to be tempted. And just like, uh, just like anything, the trial of your faith uh, being more precious than gold that perisheth, and you know what he says here? He says, whom we have not seen, yet love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now how come you can rejoice in someone you haven't seen, and you can love somebody that you haven't seen? Uh, that's because he's taken, he's taken um, the worry out of your salvation. Can you imagine? I love the illustration of uh, when they were still in Egypt and, uh, and they put the blood on the, on the doorpost. They put it you know, on the top and they put it on the sides and that kind of thing. Could you imagine the sweat? Well, I hope I put it on right. <laughs> you know, because the death, why? Because the death angel is running through tonight and somebody's going to die. If that thing's not on your doorpost, you're dead. 
right? Could you imagine being in the Old Testament and worrying about touching the wrong thing and, and saying the wrong thing and uh, having to go down to wash until even and what could happen and all that kind of stuff and knowing that you could lose it? What a tormenting thing, right? I don't have to go through life worrying about that. I got the thing settled. The Lord settled that thing for me. And uh, like I said this morning, you live, a, you live in a time that will never be again. This is, this is an impossibility for anybody uh, that was before uh, Jesus Christ and anybody after you. They'll never enjoy what you and I enjoy. This eternal security. This, is never, this has never been a thing, right, in the, in the realm of, of eternity. And uh, it says here that having not seen, you know what, I have a couple things here I have written down, unseen but not unreal. Unseen but not uninvolved. Unseen but not unfaithful. That's the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And, he, and he's able to do that because of the fact that you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And uh, it's reserved in heaven for you. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And it's a great, uh, wonderful thing that the Lord has etched out for us in the time in which you live. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. So because of that, what does the Bible tell us to do? In light of that truth, this thing about an inheritance, uh, an inheritance that you can lose, right? Uh, so you can, lose if, you, know, you can lose some things based on your service for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, this was what, what makes Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 relevant. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto man. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive a reward, look at this, of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. You see that? Now again, these are words, this word inheritance shows up in all these different places. And the doctrinal implication of that is eternal security. Now because of inter eternal security, this word inheritance has multiple meanings. Right? You have, you have an inheritance of, in First Peter there. That's a heavenly inheritance that fadeth not away. That's reserved in heaven for you. And then you also have an inheritance that you can miss out on because of lack of service or, or lack of, uh, you know, the, the right kind of service and all the things that can, can hinder that. But you have to differentiate the two. And if you don't, you get yourself in a world, you get yourself in a world of trouble uh, by teaching something that's completely false or putting somebody underneath a false uh, uh, place of bondage. Can you imagine if, if you taught that the way that is? You know how much bondage that would put you in? That your salvation is directly connected to your works in some way, shape, or form? That's what everybody tries to move it towards. That your salvation is somehow connected to what you do in the flesh. Your salvation is not connected to what you do in the flesh. Your salvation, now listen, your inheritance can be adjusted based on what you do in the flesh, but your salvation cannot. All right, so verse 14 back in Ephesians chapter number 1. I feel like you already know all this stuff and I'm just beating a, a dead horse up here, but verse number 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Okay, so you see here, that uh, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Now this is a, uh, uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 real quick. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Look in verse um, 22. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Okay, the earnest of the Spirit. Now, the earnest of the Spirit 
this is going to be uh, basically like we'll call it God's spiritual down payment. Right? We just talked about an inheritance that's reserved in heaven for you. Okay? You don't possess it at this moment. Now, the Bible tells you here in Ephesians that you're seated with Christ in heavenly places, and that's uh, no shock, you know, to to anybody that, you know, we're as good in heaven now as as we'll ever be, and all those, you know, nice songs, uh, I'm waiting on my body to be, and all that kind of stuff, those fun songs that are sung. Uh, That's a doctrinal place that that I'm in right now. But uh, there's something, my salvation is only so much completed. And so it's just like uh, anybody, if you ever bought a house before, you put in an offer on a house, they accept your offer. And what the, uh, what the lender will have you do is they'll have you put down earnest money. You know, a thousand bucks or whatever it is you got to put down. And you got to pay that earnest money. That's basically saying, I'm buying this house. Uh, here's a thousand bucks. Just hold it for me. <laughs> right? This is saying, I'm interested. Anybody ever done that? You ever sell something or, or want to buy something? You're like, well, hey, it's uh, it's it's 500 bucks. I'll give you, I'll give you, you know, 250 bucks, and you hold it, and I'll pick it up. And I'll give you the rest when I pick it up, kind of thing. It's called earnest money. Well, he gives us the earnest of the spirit, okay, um, uh, of our inheritance. This inheritance, again, uh, he 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 gives us something that only people could dream of. When you think about what I'm talking about, uh, the Holy Spirit being involved in your life the way the Holy Spirit is involved in your life is something that the Old Testament saints could only dream about. Now you think, I would have much preferred an angel coming down from heaven and, heaven and wrestling with me all night. I don't think you would. I call your bluff on that one. Uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that I would prefer to uh, have to watch Moses get up on top of a mountain and watch the uh, thunder and the lightning and all the stuff that goes on with that. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is I have, I have the third man of the Trinity living and taking up residency inside my body at all times, leading and guiding me into all truth, uh, utilizing my conscience to help direct my steps and guide my paths and kind of pushing the brakes and stepping on the gas and, and helping me think about things and revealing things to me. I have got a co-pilot with me, or a pilot, I should say, uh, and, uh, and, and he's guiding me down life's road all the time. And no matter what I mess up, whether it be temptations of the flesh or bad decisions or whatever they may be, He'll never leave me nor forsake me. That's amazing. What a, what a, what a standing is yours and mine. Okay, uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This, more on this uh, earnest of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Starting verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us from the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. You see the earnest of the Spirit. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, look in verse, we'll start in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the, look at this, first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, what? The redemption of our bodies. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not, uh, is not hope, For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So we're given another place what he's called here is the first fruits of the Spirit. And so we're only partially saved tonight. You're only partially saved. Your body is still rooted in the flesh. Right? Just like we talked about with, uh, you know, if, if these uh, works of the flesh are manifest and if you do these things, then you won't inherit the kingdom of God. Well, 
if you understand what your position is with Jesus Christ and the teaching behind that, what you realize is that, yes, you're in the flesh. There's no doubt about it. But we have been given the earnest of the Spirit, and He convicts us of sin and of judgment, right? And what He does is He illuminates the Bible to us to help us to put our flesh into subjection as we walk on the face of this planet. And one of these days, what we're all waiting for is for this old, decrepit, sinful mess that is our flesh to finally be redeemed and given a glorified body. And when we get to that place, the Bible says that the whole creation groaneth. You know what? I feel, I think that, I think that people are starting to feel it now. I think the whole world is, 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 is realizing there's, there's, there's some groanings going on. What is going on? Things are crazy. Well, and, and you talk to people that don't even go to church. You just talk to people that, you know, have a brain and watch the TV. <laughs> you know what they, you know what they're saying? Something's going on. Something's going on. What is that? That's the whole creation groaning because of a curse that was placed on this thing when sin entered into the world. You realize it wasn't just sin that entered the world. There was curse on the land. There was, there was, there was curse on everything, right? Thorns and thistles and all this different stuff and uh, you know, the, 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 the animals and, and, and how everything is, you know, you can imagine sitting down with a lion and, and, a, and a lamb sitting down together. That's after the curse is lifted, right? All of that's a byproduct of the curse. And so man, right now, what they don't even realize is, uh, is that there's things going on right now that cannot be explained with a human mind. You can't explain it. It doesn't make any sense. It seems self-destructive. And if it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't make any carnal sense for them to think the way they think, you know what that tells you? That it's spiritual. It's not carnal. It's spiritual in nature. And everybody's looking around saying, I'm waiting for something to happen. I'm waiting for, you know, the weakest link to break. I'm waiting for, you know, everybody. Now you have everybody just waiting for the apocalypse. You know, that's what they think is going to happen. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> you see? You, you've been given the earnest of the Spirit. He's given you a down payment and saying, hey, don't, don't worry about it. One of these days you're going to hear a trumpet sound and that body is going to be raised incorruptible. And this, in, and this corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And one of these days you're going to get a new, a new body and you're going to get a new mind. And you're not ever going to think bad again. You're not ever going to think about sin again. You're not even going to have the opportunity to sin again. You know what? That's probably one of the things that, that, that I'm just looking forward to the most is getting out of my own head. How about that one? How about one of these days, you're going to get to be in heaven one of these days, right? And because of what Jesus Christ did for you and I, we're never going to mess up again. I'm never going to fail him again. Man, that's a blessing. You know what? It's, it's, not, it's, it's not everything about, we, we focus a lot on the, the, the here and now and the stuff that's going on down here. But if you could just take a second, some of these basic Bible doctrines that we see here, you know what, man, it, it really shows you the Lord's got an amazing plan that we're involved in. Yes, He does. And uh, so He says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession uh, unto the praise of His glory. Look at verse number 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, this is an attribute of Paul that should be mimicked by all Christians. And this is that he rejoices when he hears about the faith of others. This is, this is an attribute of Paul that, again, like I say, should be mimicked by all Christians. Uh, because, unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians that do not rejoice when they hear about the faith of others. And that's a sad thing. I mean, that whole message we talked about this morning, you know what the premise of that whole message is? A, a brother in fear of another brother killing him because of something that he did wrong to another brother. It's internal conflict. Right? And Paul, and Paul mentions and talks about that several times in his writings, that there be no schism in the body and there be no divisions among you. And, 
And how can I talk to you about spiritual things when you're all wrapped up in carnal things? And he's talking about the, the way that the Corinthians are, 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 are behaving themselves in the church. Paul is the kind of guy that he says, Wherefore also I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love to all the saints. Hey, man, I'm, I'm seeing and I'm listening to what people are saying about you. And I'm seeing what you're doing for God. And I just want to let you know I pray for you every day. <laughs> what a great thing. You know, the vow, to see and be, and be happy for what other people are doing and encouraging them to continue in what they're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not comparing himself amongst anybody else, but rather always being a wind in somebody's sails to try to keep them going on a little further. He says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes, uh, you know, you can not have the words to say when it comes to praying for other people uh, and that kind of thing. And what the Lord's doing here in these next few verses is giving you an outline of some things you could pray for for other people, yeah. you know. And uh, you say, I don't know how to pray for so-and-so. Well, here's a, here's a pretty good outline. <laughs> how about this? How about praying that, uh, that uh, uh, he give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him? You don't think people need that? You know, a lot of times, you know, we come on Wednesday night, and you know what a lot of times the, uh, the prayer requests are? For people trying to make the right decisions about things. Well, you know what? You need wisdom. You need God to reveal to you what it is he'd have for you to do. And Paul knows that that's, that's an important thing, so he knows how to pray for him. The revelation and the knowledge of him. Verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. How about that one? <laughs> the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. All of us need more understanding. All of us need our eyes to be enlightened. There's sometimes there's things that you just can't see. And it is, it's, it's difficult sometimes because we, we sometimes find ourselves living in a fishbowl and we can't see outside of the, of the little small area that we're swimming around in. And there's sometimes there's people that are outside of that thing looking in that can give you an insight and can give you some help about some things that you would no otherwise be able to figure out. And what the Lord will do sometimes is He'll put people in your life uh, to, to help you uh, get a better perspective, get a better angle, you know, show you some things and help you out. And so he says that your eyes uh, of understanding should be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. You know what he says? He says that, uh, that you're called. That's not just, that's not just, uh, that's not just preachers. That's all of us. You're called to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're called to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You're called, if you're a husband in here, you're called to be, uh, you're called to be a good husband. You're called to be a father. You're called to, you're called to raise your kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You're called to dwell with your wife according to knowledge. Ladies, you're called to submit to your husbands as unto Christ. You say, what is that? That's a part of your calling. The Bible has a way of doing things. And when you submit to the Bible way of doing things, you allow God the opportunity to move in your life. Paul knows that. This is, you say this is a generic prayer. Yeah, but it's rooted in what he knows about God. You know what I'm saying? It's like somebody come up to you and say, I just got saved. You know, what should I pray about? Right there. You, know, you may not know you need this, but you need this. Right? You know what? It's, it's amazing that there's, there's so many situations that arise in our lives that we don't do them the, the, the biblical way and we don't even give God the opportunity to work in that situation. Because what you have to understand, God is not going to work in your life outside of the confines of the Bible. He's not going to. 
And so if you're facing something in your marriage, in your relationships, in, in, your, in your work life and <clears throat> all the different things maybe you're doing uh, outside of church and, and that kind of thing, the, the Bible has something to say about it. You know, I, I, you, you hear it said a lot, or, you know, if, if there's certain things, certain things you, responsibilities you have in your life, can you name three or four Bible verses on the responsibilities that you currently hold in your life? If you're a husband, can you name three or four Bible verses on being a husband? If you're a wife, can you name three or four Bible verses on being a wife? If you got kids, can you, can you three or four Bible verses on raising kids? If you're a kid, can you got three or four Bible verses on how you're supposed to, uh, to conduct yourself as a young person? Right? You say, why is that important? Because the Bible has something to say about those things. And sometimes we go through life and our eyes are dark because we don't know. And, and the Lord's saying, hey, there's, I got something to say about that. I got something to say about that. You say, oh, I don't see God moving in my life. Are you, are you allowing him to? Are you allowing him to? Because so many times we don't. We don't even give him the opportunity to move. You have a problem with a brother or a sister? Okay, here's a, the first question I always ask. Have you gone to that brother or sister and talked to them about it? Oh, well, I would probably, they would say this, and I already know. The Bible tells you what to do. And you know what? You won't see God move because you won't do what God told you to do. You see that? Well, my husband, this, that, okay. Are you submitting to your husband as under the, uh, as under the Lord? Well, you don't know. Okay. And you wonder why God's not moving in the life of your husband. And you wonder why God's not moving in the life of your wife. You thought that you could just tell her what to do, bless God, because you're the husband and she's going to do what you, what you told her to do. And then you realize, that's not how that works. <laughs> right? Because she's like a person with like a brain. That's so quiet right now. I'm, I'm failing miserably up here. I'm just flopping like a fish out, on, out of the water right now. Listen, man. You see that? She's got a, she's got a mind. It's going to take a few years for some to realize, that, yeah, she does have a brain. She has her own thoughts and her own opinions, right? And you ain't going to change her by saying, you need to do this, bless God. And the Bible tells you you need to dwell with her according to knowledge. Right? And you're supposed to love her like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And you're supposed to provide for her. And if you don't, you're worse than an infidel. Well, I want God to... You may have some legitimate criticisms of your spouse, of your kids, of your work, of your boss, of the different situations in your life. You may have valid, valid problems. But it's never... It's never on them. It's always on you. How do you respond? Well, are you doing it the biblical way? Are you doing what you're supposed to do? Because if you're not going to do it the biblical way, guess what? God is under no obligation to move in that circumstance. And I feel like because so many times we're ignorant of some of these things, this is the reason why a lot of people don't see God moving in their life. Okay? And so it's just a matter of, I mean... Spend a, just spend a little bit of time, a little bit of effort. And Paul's saying, you know what I know you need? <laughs> you need your eyes of understanding to be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. That you know exactly what God would have you to do. Right? He's saying, um, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. He wants you to know how good it's going to be later on. He wants you to, he wants, he wants everyone that he's praying for. He doesn't know them by name. He doesn't have a personal relationship with them. But he's heard about their faithfulness and he's heard about what they're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, I want every one of you guys to be heavenly minded and keep your eyes fixated on what's going to be happening here in eternity. Because if we can keep our eyes on that, it'll keep our hearts in the right spot. Paul knows it. 
And so that's what Paul's praying for. And uh, I would be remiss to say, I wonder sometimes with Christians the way the, the world is today, that uh, the reason that they're so fixated on the, on the current events is because their heart is so far away from thinking about where they're going. And so everything you have and everything you think about is tied to what's going on now, down here, on this earth. And we're less heavenly minded now than we have ever been in the, in the history of the church. We think less about where we're going now than we ever have before. What's the problem with that? Because you're closer to getting there than you have ever been at any time in the history of the church. You see that? We're the closest we've ever been, but yet it's the furthest from our mind. What is that? That's the deception of the devil. That's the deception of the time. That's we're in the fourth watch of the night, man, and we're just fighting back those heavy eyelids and we're fighting back the, 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 the sleep uh, monster that's on our back. And it's like, what in the world? I'm trying to keep my eyes open. I'm trying to keep my, my affection set on things above and not on things of this earth. I'm trying to keep my mind right. I'm trying to fight the good fight of faith. But man, it's tiring. And Paul says, I want to make sure that you understand the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's what I'm praying for. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? <laughs> Verse 19. He says, I'm praying that you understand that there's nothing that God can't do. But the world is so bad. Hey, there's nothing that God can't do. I've been praying for them for 40 years. Hey, there's nothing that God can't do. The situation, there's nothing that God can't do. Paul is sitting here from a position of experience saying, I, I, I'm telling you, I've seen God do some things. Things that I would think are impossible. And he is not limited in his power. Right? Right? But again, do we allow him the opportunity to work? Do we allow him the opportunity to, to, to utilize his power in our lives? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, uh, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in which is to come. So again, speaking to the preeminence that God gives the, gives the Lord Jesus Christ because of his subjection to him. So the principle outlined right here with Jesus Christ is the same for you and I. Right? He that abaseth himself shall be exalted, and he that exalteth himself shall be abased. So the way up is down, and the way down is up. It's these... Uh, it's the ironies of the Bible, right? And when he's talking about when he's talking about this, he's showing this resurrection, this resurrection power that the Lord has demonstrated in Jesus Christ, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, verse 20. And that he set him on the right hand. Look at where he's uh, where he says here in verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. You say, why is that significant? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. What does that mean? That means that the one that's living inside of me is above all of them. Right? My source of strength and my source of power, what Paul just said, is connected far above all the things that are actively seeking to destroy me. That's where he is. He's above all that. Isn't that good to know? <laughs> Paul's praying for new Christians. Paul's praying for people young in the faith. And he's saying, I want you to get a hold of some things. And this is one of the things I want you to get a hold of. I want you to know where Jesus Christ, the one that you're serving, the one that you're praying to, the one that you're submitting your life to, the one that you're trying to seek after and walk after, the where he's at is above all the problems that you have in this life. He's far above it all. His position and his location 
is of the utmost importance when Paul is talking to young Christians. And if he's talking, and what I found out is if even if you're a young Christian, it's still important for you when you become an old Christian. Right? It's a part of the fundamentals. It's a part of the basics. And sometimes it's really important for us to really just step back and take a look and say, you know what, Lord, you're above all this stuff. You're on a totally different playing field. Your thoughts are so far above my thoughts, and your ways are above my ways. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a limited view, right? And I only see through a glass darkly. But I know this, that the wrestlings that I do in my own mind and in, with the principalities and powers and the spiritual wickedness in high places, the problems that I face in this life, the discouragements that come, I know that my Lord is above all of that. And so what does that mean? That means the closer I get to him, the further I get away from all that mess. So if, if you're super bogged down tonight, if you're super, you know, uh, wore out tonight, what does that tell you? I need to get a little higher. I need, to get, I need some elevation to my life right now. I need, to, I need to get closer to him. It alludes to what we preached about this morning and in, uh, in, in taking the time to, to get alone. And, and seeking out the Lord and what he'd have you to do. All right? Far above all principality and power and might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. What a blessing that is. He hath put all things under his feet. That means he controls everything. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church. That's the church, his body. That's the church, what we call the church universal from a theological standpoint. It's the church universal. That is all saved people make up the body of Jesus Christ. Right? And we have a local body, which is Anchor Baptist Church. And then you have other lo local churches. Those are local bodies. But you have the church universal, which is the bride of Christ, which is the church as a whole. And that makes up the body of Christ. And he's the head of that body. And it's also important to remember that in Ephesians chapter 5, he's giving you an illustration of the church, right? That's, that's where the mystery uh, of the church is revealed is in Ephesians chapter 5. He's simply using the illustration of a husband and wife relationship to illustrate the mystery of the church. Now that is beneficial in two ways. For one, we get enlightenment on what the church is, and that is Christ is the head. And we should submit ourselves to Christ the head and allow that uh, the, the proper order of things. But it also helps us in the home. It also helps us with the structure, right? That if uh, you have the head of a household, which is the man, and then you have the wife who is in subjection to her head, and then everything falls in the line underneath that. And so... The Lord has got this thing. He, he's speaking here in these last few verses of structurally where the Lord Jesus Christ fits in to what it is he's doing. Now, he's the head. He's the capstone. He's the chief cornerstone, right? But there's a lot of things that fall into place underneath him. And if we want the Lord to, you know, work in our lives and to bless our homes and to bless the church and all those kinds of things, we have to realize that there's structure to things, there's a godly order. He's speaking to that right now. And that the Lord put everything and, 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 and put everything underneath Jesus Christ's feet, that he should be the head, right? Uh, the head over all things to the church. Okay, well, he, he references that back to Ephesians chapter 5, which he's talking about the husband being in, uh, providing for his wife and the wife being in subjection to the husband and all those things. That's old-fashioned. That's going the way of the dodo bird. You say that now, you're a sexist bigot. You understand? That, but folks, the reality of it is, just like Paul talked about a few verses before this, about having your, uh, your eyes uh, of an understanding enlightened that you may know which is the hope of his calling, right? It still works. It still works. And the, 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 the source of a lot of our trouble is when we get the order out of order, right? Listen, that can happen in many different ways. Sometimes that can happen from, from, a, from uh, a kid that, you know, is, refuses to submit to his mother, a young, a young boy refusing to submit to his mother. 
You see that all the time, right? A young kid, and he's got, you know, he just doesn't want a woman telling him what to do. I can relate to that. I understand that. But the fact of the matter is, is you're living at home. You need to respect your mom. Now, see, that's old-fashioned. That's okay, though, because it still works, right? It still works. Even though it's old-fashioned, it still works, right? It happens when men become too passive and allow their wives to do whatever they want to do. That one went over a lot less <laughs> as the first one. I did that on purpose, by the way. <laughs> I said, let me hit the young men that are not, that are not hitting their, uh, you know, that are not... Uh, uh, you know, respecting their moms, and then we'll hit with that one, and we'll see how it works. <laughs> You're right. You say, I don't care how, how horrible that sounds in the uh, politically correct atmosphere, which is our day. The fact of the matter is, that's the truth. Because the society that you're in now is raising a bunch of men that don't know how to lead a home, and they don't know how to lead a woman. And if you ladies are honest here tonight, I know what you want. I know what every single one of you want. You want a, a husband to take care of you and protect you and watch out for you and to lead you and you can trust him and, uh, and, and you can rely on him to do the right thing for you and your family. That's exactly what you want. And if you don't, and if you don't want that, somebody has gotten into your ear and had told you and taught you something else. That's what you want. But it's hard to find in a society today a man that will actually lead his family. You say, what's our, who's our example? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. He leads the church. He's led by example. <laughs> and when we negate the order in the home, then we're asking for problems in the home. When we negate the order in the church, we're asking for problems in the church. Even in your friendships, ladies and gentlemen, there's, there's friendships. And you know what there is? There's natural boundaries and orders to friendships. And if you don't honor those boundaries and those orders and, 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 and the way things are, you don't respect those boundaries, you're going to have problems in your friendships. Because you can't get out of the thing that is the order in which God has set things up to be. We're in the last verse, so I'm going to stop it right here. Uh, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He is everywhere. <laughs> uh, he says, though I make my bed in hell, thou art there. He says, where can I flee to? I can't go anywhere. The fact of the matter is, is these truths that are contained in the Bible, whether they're politically correct, whether they, you know, make me feel good about myself or, you know, boost my self-esteem or whatever it may be, as hard as sometimes they are to swallow, guess what? You can't get away from them. You can't get away from them. You know what I've observed? I've, I've observed lost people that, uh, unbeknownst to them, are following a pattern of the proper kind of uh, structure, authority, right? And it works. Anybody in here ever noticed that? There's plenty of you people in here, you know folks that aren't saved, that have great marriages and good home lives and raise good kids and all that kind of stuff. You want to know why? You know what you'll find? Some of those principles are, are outlined in their life somewhere. You want to know why? Because it's a universal truth. It's a universal truth. More and more nowadays, the church is the ones that are kicking back from it. They're kicking away and saying, that's, that's just, you can't. Because you can't, you can't equate the culture with the Bible. And where culture goes against the Bible, here's the nugget of the night. You go with the Bible and you chuck out the culture. Right? Because the culture ain't going to help you in your home, and the culture ain't going to help you with your marriage, and ain't going to help you with your kids, ain't going to help you with the situations you face in life, and when the bad news comes and all these kinds of things, you need God in your life to help you with that stuff, and the culture doesn't care how close you are to God. 
See, it's not, this, isn't, this isn't a teaching uh, of, of make you a better you and you know, focus on your family and all that kind of stuff. What it is, though, is the problems that you face in life, they come from those different sectors of your life. You have these different areas of your life. And when you have problems in those areas, you need to check up, just like Paul was praying for those uh, young Christians uh, back there in verse what, 16 and 17. And he's saying, I want you to open up their eyes. I want you to give them wisdom. I want you to let them see. I want you to show them that you can, you can fix the problems, that you're not limited in your power, that you're above all the, the, the things that they're struggling with. You're far above all those things. Keep your eyes on heaven and then pay attention to the structure and the order and the authority of the way God set things up. And if you do that, you know what you're going to do? You're going to have the best chance of the Lord being in your life. You've seen His hand working in your life. And you not getting through this thing bitter and heartbroken and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, you'll have bitterness and heartbreak and all those things, but you'll be able to get through it because the Lord will be right there with you. And Paul knew that. We won't have an altar call tonight because we're just teaching and everything else, but uh, we'll go ahead and pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this Bible. Thank you for the truth that is contained in it. Lord, I pray that tonight some of the things that were brought out, Lord, would be of help, uh, whether it just be uh, a teaching of... Uh, some doctrinal thing or some practical thing that was mentioned, Father, that you would uh, bear fruit in the hearts of these that are here. And I pray that you'd be with our pastor, get them feeling better, get them on the, uh, get them on the men, Lord. And we pray, God, that you'd bless these folks that came out and may they go home uh, having their bellies full uh, with some spiritual food. And we ask it now this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.